sometimes you just had all you could take, you were dry, you were ready for God to just call you in, call you home, guess what? God wants to restore all of us. He wants to let the dry bones come alive. Let's all get up and sing that again. Let's sing that chorus with us. Saw the two geese flying overhead, holding a stick, 
but the frog <laughs> holding only in the middle with his mouth. So in the crowd exclaimed, what a brilliant idea. I wonder who thought of that. The frog proudly exclaimed, I did. <laughs> <laughs> pride coming before the fall and pride coming before the big fall. Wow, can you imagine how far he fell? Hey, fell, excuse me, I can't even talk. God's so good. Yeah, there you go. There you go, there you go. There you go. So that must have been kind of good. She so at least clap. All right. Okay, the crucified life. I, I actually was going to do this in one Sunday, and so far it's been two Sundays, and I'm going to tell you there's going to be a third one. Amen? Because it's just so rich. I just hate to, to rush. And I hate to miss the richness of all this in here. So for the benefit of those that weren't here last Sunday, there's going to be a few slides in from last Sunday. Also to bring some uh, uh, clarity and continuity. So here we go. Get ready. Ready? Get your Bibles out of Galatians. And stand for the reading of the word. Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians is in the New Testament. Just check it out. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Y'all say this with me. Y'all read it in the Bible. Verse 20. Y'all read it aloud as I read it. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me just read that next verse, it's pretty cool. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if Christ has come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I wonder how many of us may be frustrating. <laughs> Uh, grace today. Ready? Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, that you're alive and well on the throne. Father, I thank you, God, that there's absolutely nothing that's beyond your scope, nothing beyond you can do for us. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch the minister. Lord, help us, God, to understand there's a powerful force taking place and moving in our midst right now. Help us realize that this is the most important two hours of our week. Lord, I forgot to put it on the slide, but that's okay, because we're going to say it anyway. But Lord, in the name of Jesus, bless this service, and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Church said? Amen. Now, before you sit down, tell somebody first, this is the most important two hours of my week. Lord, help me gather from it. And strength. In the name of Jesus. Now look at somebody and say the past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing, and nothing shall be impossible. Amen. I'll read it one more time. Galatians 2 and 20. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. Amen. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Look at somebody say you can't do it on your own. Amen. Amen. God is so good. All the time. Okay, let's just go to a few from last week and then we're going to jump right into it. Satan desires to affect our thinking, our life. And our relationships. He wants to affect them, the way we see things. He wants to affect our outlook. He wants to affect our perspective. Because if he can affect that, then he can infect your thinking, your life, and your relationships. How many, how many sometimes you're doing fine and all of a sudden Satan starts playing with your mind? And then all of a sudden, all the things that you were talking about, all the things you were enjoying, no longer you no longer enjoy them, or, or you were doing fine with folks, and now all of a sudden you're not doing fine at all. How, how has it ever been there? Amen. Satan wants to do that. And yes, quickly, curious. Uh, I love that. Ten Commandments. <laughs> There's Ten Commandments. There for, these are fine, but what's in it for me? <laughs> hey, have you ever felt like... No, don't, don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> have you ever seen anybody that was like that? 
You're trying to live godly, and all I'm saying is, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this? Amen? So, so here we go. We, we live uh, in a what's in it for me society. I see it all the time. I get blown away by the stuff I see. The, the, this attitude, it hinders the move of God or the inward part of God in our life, and it hinders the work of God, the outward part. And Jesus warns us against this attitude, but we're going to tell you how to get beyond this attitude. Again, let this mind, this attitude be in you, which was also uh, in Christ Jesus. So here we go. We're getting ready to jump in. Y'all say, let the plow down, Pastor. Let the plow down. Come on. Let the plow down. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, you're going to see some new ones in the front. Then you're going to see a bunch of new ones in the back. Amen. At Calvary, it was about us. We were lost in sin. We needed a Savior. Jesus followed us when we were at. He caught me in places that I would never be caught in now to find me, to convict me, to bring me out. When the Calvary was about me, but now it's about Jesus and building his kingdom. I beseech you, brethren, therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, now, now watch this now. This is Paul's only angry letter. He was mad when he wrote this. He was, he was ticked off. So I say, holy ticked. He was wholly ticked. Amen. What was going on? It's because he saw what was going on. They were trying to live a religious life. They were trying to live a godly life. They were trying to live according to the law. They were trying to live according to grace. And they were getting all mixed up in all they were doing. And they were trying to please people around them that were religious. They were trying to please Jesus, who is definitely not religious. So, so he saw there was a potential. And that, that potential here, watch this, is, is a hindrance and a devastation. Because when you try to do it your way in God's way, you're trying to face two directions at the same time. Listen to me carefully. If you're trying to do something today in your own strength, in your own wisdom, in your own authority, if you're trying to walk in your own wisdom, or you're trying to live a religious experience and also trying to, to live a godly life with Jesus Christ at that hill, then you're in a dangerous position because you are facing two different directions. And when you live, face two different directions, you wind up uh, having a divided heart. The Bible tells us in James, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Why? Because when you're double-minded, it's destructive. We mix faith with fear. And when we're double-minded, we wind up getting distracted and we begin looking two ways. And so when we do this, this is some bad, bad stuff. Now here's where we're at last week. This last slide from last week. And then we're going to go right into this week. <coughs> Here's the key is first off, when a man's on the cross, when you have crucified the flesh, when you are on that cross, we talked about that last week, I'm not going back in it, but when you've caught up on that cross, here's what happens. Number one, you have a focused look. You're no longer looking to the left or right because now you're on the cross. On the cross, you can't look behind you, you can't look around, you are on the that cross. Luke 9 51 said he set his face to danger or his face toward Jerusalem and he knew what awaited, but he still had that focused look. Isaiah 50 and 7 says he set his face like a flint. That means his, 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 his actions, his attitude, his outlook was hard, impassive, determined, fixed. He was not ashamed. He was going to Jerusalem there to be crucified. And of course, we went way into this last week. We're not going to do it this week. Joshua 1, 1 through 7, Joshua now was taken over after Moses had died, and he said, I don't want you looking to the left, I don't want you looking to the right, I don't want you looking behind you, I want you looking ahead for what I got coming for you. That's part of being crucified is first, you got to focus look. Number two, a person on the cross has made a decision. Listen carefully. First, there was a direction. You're facing only one direction. And number two, there's a decision. I'm not going back. Now I've heard it said, and it's even been told, of several people have been told of Caesar, have been told of Alexander the Great, have been told of some other great leaders, that whenever they would go over to, a, to an island or go someplace over the sea to take the land, once they got over on the other side of the shore of the other land, they would pull up all the boats, they would pull them up in the center, and they would burn them. Why would they burn them? Because it said we're either going to conquer or be conquered. We're not going back. We're not running. How many has got that I'm not running attitude? 
Amen. We got this thing. God's got it. We're not turning back. We don't have to. So, so look, his mind, a person across his mind is, is made up. 2 Kings 19.21, when Elijah, uh, when Elijah called Elisha, Elijah was Elisha was plowing. And he took the plow, he burnt the plow, and he sacrificed the oxen. Now, what did that mean? It means symbolic. He was leaving his past behind him. Some of you here right now could have a whole lot better relationship with God, with yourself, with your spouse, with your children, with your family, with your co-workers. If you can find a way to leave your past behind. Not carry it with you, not drag it with you. Some people bring a portfolio with them. And we ever sit down and say, well, how's it going? They pull out the portfolio, and then they got to go through 25 different things, and how somebody hurt them and discouraged them and done stuff to them, and you find out it was so long ago, it shouldn't even matter anymore. Thank God that you were at least alive enough to know it happened, and it did something for you. You cannot let the past poison your present. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That's a good fact, Yes. Yeah. You cannot let your past poison your present. Going today, going today, they keep getting more and more of them. They keep, they get left out, let out of B5, and, and, and when they get out of B5, they're going to meet on Sundays at this halfway house, and we, we still talk about God, and we're doing steps, and we're going to do mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy. These guys are so excited. They say, Here's what they keep telling me. Look, they said, every time I got out before, I came back, and I came back, and I came back. They said, thank God for B5. Because once I went into B5, they, they started feeding in me. Not just holding me to pull time. They started feeding into me. And as they started feeding into me, then we realized we don't have to come back. The other day I told one guy, I said, well, when we get through the 12 steps, we're going to get all the guys together, the ones in B5 and the ones out. We're going to have a party and we're going to have a graduation. You know what the guy told me? He said, that's not important to me. It's not, what's important to me is, is I'm not going back. Wow. I'm not going back. So you cannot let the past poison the present. You cannot let the past prevent your future. Yes, there's things in my past I wish I hadn't have done. Yes, there's things in my past that are embarrassing. Yes, there's things in my past that I wish I would never even thought of. But you know what? I can't let Satan keep dragging it up because Jesus has forgiven me See, if I let Satan drag it up, then I'm going to live a religious life and we'll face two different directions. I'm facing the past and I'm facing the future and I don't know which way to go. you got to let it go. That's why I said let it go. That's why I said let it go. Y'all can sing that song now. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> I hear the brick and stuff my toe. Let it go. <laughs> All right. Every Sunday. What we say every Sunday? The past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing shall be impossible. I might keep you long today. I know y'all think that. What do y'all consider long? <laughs> there you go. Long as we we keep on going. There you go. So we might be here till whenever. Okay, ready? Get ready. What's this? Yeah, I remember that. A focused mind. Focused mind power is one of the strongest forces on the earth. When your mind is focused, when you get your mind focused, it is so powerful. I'm not, now look, sometimes, sometimes we call it being hard-headed. Oh, come on, y'all. Sometimes hard-headed is not a good thing. But when you're working for God, God's trying to bring you out of something and bring you forward, and you focus that mind. It's amazing what will happen because then things will happen. A focused mind power, the power of a focused mind is one of the strongest forces on the earth. So here we go. Not as a mind that's made up, it's a mind that's motivated. Now, what am I talking about? Watch this. If you have a made up mind, your action will follow that made up mind. Think about it. Once you make up your mind and you say, okay, God, I've made up my mind. Now what do I do? God says, now do it. Actions.
action follows a made up mind. There's always a danger of not following through. I, I remember a family. A lot of times before we started, before our, before our department really got going and, and, and started changing the place and, and saving money and, and changing the way things were done, a lot of times people would start it, but they would never finish it. They would talk a good talk, but that was it. They just talked it. They didn't walk it. And right to start with, people got aggravated with me. Because I carried my notebook. I walk over there to them and I go, now what are we going to do next? They said, well, can you give me a minute? I said, no, I can't give you a minute. What are we going to do next? He goes, can't you ask somebody else? I said, you're the number one. Everybody says you're the number one. You're the one that knows more about this than anybody. Now what are we going to do next? Well, I'm really kind of busy. I said, you're going to be busier if you don't tell me what time it is. Tell me this. Because I'm not going to leave you alone until you tell me. He goes, okay. And I did it. Now, I said, tell me where else to go. I go somewhere else. And I go and I go and go. And I found out a lot of times in our own life, if we learn to follow through, it's amazing what will happen. I just talk it. But walk it. Look at somebody and say, don't just talk it, walk it. Tell somebody. It's okay, tell them. Don't just talk it, walk it. That's right. Walk it out. Walk it. Somebody say, walk it out. Walk it out. There you go. So look, look next time you see somebody and they're looking kind of strange, that they're actually doing something different, you say, what are you doing? You just say, I'm walking it out. I'm walking it out. Ready? Watch this. Hey, we're going to talk about this danger here. Here, here. Here's the danger here. Luke 9, 62. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people think that's talking about heaven and hell. Nope. Not, not even close. That's not talking about heaven and hell. Nope. Then what's it talking about? It's talking about trying to live out to walk it out here on earth and getting in your own way. Watch this. Let's, 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 let's just hit this one time. Some of y'all, I've hit this before, so you, you'll know I've hit this scripture on so many times. Watch this. The Bible says, any man having put his hands in the plow, I want you to notice something. God didn't force him. Any man having put his hand to the plow, something you do on your own. We've made a decision. We've made up our mind. Now we're motivated and we get started. How many walk out of here on Sunday ready to chase down hell with a water pistol? When you get out of here, you can't find hell with a water pistol. <laughs> you get out of here going, I'm ready. I'm going to win this. I'm going to bring 25. I don't even see you next week. Well, if you understood, I just didn't feel good. And my ball game was on. Bonanza had a special. <laughs> I'm leaving the phone, y'all. Y'all come up to me and excuse it. There we go. So I see us. There was cool. I tell people all the time about this. The Bible says, Jesus said that the man invited people to the supper, the great supper. And, and he asked the first man, and the first, had three men, the first two men had a good excuse. The first man, or they didn't have an excuse, only one man had a good excuse. The first man said, well, I bought a, a, a lot of land, a lot. And this is supper time, I got to check it out. How? They didn't have lights back then. There were not street lights. And my dad used to tell me all the time, son, I said, we need to come back home at night, Daddy. We need to go back in and see when the street lights come on. We didn't have street lights. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. He said, I can't go to your supper because I gotta try this land. I gotta see this land. How? It's dark. Second guy, that was not a good excuse. Second guy's excuse. What's this? Now, I'm not saying you can't have good excuses, because sometimes there's a reason and there's an excuse. Reasons are different than excuses. Reasons 
on a legitimate reason or something that really happened. It's where Jesus made an account and said, made a, made, said look, said, sometimes your ox falls in a ditch on Sunday and you got to get him out of the ditch. That's different. We're not talking about reasons. We're talking about excuses. There's a difference. Look at somebody said there's a difference in a reason and an excuse. Okay. So now, the second guy, he says, well, I just bought a yoke of oxen. I want to try them. How? They didn't have headlights. How are you going to try them? How are you going to go out in the field in the dark? But the third man had the perfect excuse. He said, why did you come to the supper? He said, I can't. He said, I got it. He said, I just married a wife. <laughs> okay, y'all missed it. <laughs> All right. Decision. I need to throw that one away. Where's that at? <laughs> okay. No man forced him. But now he's distracted. Watch this. If any man puts his hand in the plow, he's talking about working for God. Working for God. So any man putting his hand to the plow, meaning now you're working for God. And while you're working for God, it says he puts his hand to the plow, meaning I'm getting it done. And he looks back. Think about it. I've done that before. I'm trying to work for God. But, um, hey, <laughs> yeah, you hear what I am? Hey, hey, here we go. Yeah, glory, yeah. Guess what it says? You end up putting his hand to the plow. You made that decision. And you get distracted. Watch this. All of a sudden now, what you do is damaged. Why? You try to, it's hard enough to plow, but you got to try it. Can you imagine with the mule or with the oxen, especially when they're teamed up side by side, and you're trying to keep them going straight, you're trying to make sure that you got to, you're tugging it the right way with them, and they're going along and trying to make straight rows. And while you're trying to do this with these animals that can be hard to get along with, and you're looking all around, you're going to wind up damaging what you're trying to fix. And so it's so important. Some of us, have a lot of things in our life that's been damaged. And we wonder, how did it get so damaged? Let me just tell you. Could it be, I'm just asking, could it be that you put your hand to the plow and all of a sudden, you start looking back? Hmm. I think that was just, I think that was simmer for me. A mind is made up, a mind that is motivated, and a mind that is maintained. It's so easy to lose heart on the eve of a breakthrough. What I have discovered is most of the time, when you get to the point where you just have so much that you're ready to throw the towel in, it's at this point that breakthrough's on the other side. You've climbed that mountain. You've got all the way to the top of it. You're tired. You just want to sit down. And you're right there. You know, uh, I read a story. I'm trying to remember which mountain it is. I don't think it's Mount Mitchell. I don't think it's Mount Everest. But there's a certain mountain that guys climb. And they climb it all the time. And it's very deadly. And it's very cold, and they climb it in the middle of winter, mid of winter. And so because so many people have gotten hurt and or injured or lost their lives, halfway up the mountain is a little cabin. In this cabin, it's there, it's got heat, it's got water, it's got hot drinks, it's got food. It's an awesome shelter. And when people... Climb, start climbing that mountain. Those that decide that the journey is too hard, when they start looking back, they'll go in this little house and they'll stay there and get rejuvenated and they'll climb back down the mountain. And I heard the guy who actually ran that house said, without fail, people come in and say, I can't make another step. I really can't do any more. I'm about to freeze. I'm injured. And it says it gets them in the room. 
and gives them hot food, hot drink, wraps them up, and says, without fail, every last one of them, look out the window and get the strangest look on their face when their comrades keep climbing. stop. It's too important. It's way too important. There's too many lives at stake. There's too many families at stake. We can't stop climbing. We've got to do what it takes to get up that mountain. Because I promise you, when you feel like giving up, when you get to that point, that's when God's going to show you breakthrough. It says in Isaiah 26 and 3, He'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Him. Let's look at that for a second. My mind is stayed on him, which means leaned upon him. I can sit back and look through all the things in life, and I can think about the times where somebody goes, how in the world did you do that? How'd you make it through that? How'd you make it through this? How did you go through this with my mom? How'd you wind up going through that with such a good attitude? With, with your wife, how'd you go through that with such a good attitude? With Bethany, with such a good attitude. You know, and I say, well, I was definitely hurting. I said, but you know what? The grace that I felt and the comfort that I felt was much stronger than the pain I felt. And so it helped me to get through it. How did that happen? Because I leaned on Him. We sing that learning to lean, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I ever dreamed, learning to lean on Jesus. When you find yourself about to throw in the towel, you've made your mind up, I'm not going back. You've been motivated, you start taking those steps, and now it's got hard. Really hard. I'm talking about so hard that you just wish it was all over. And it's at this point breakthrough is just on the other side. Keep your mind stayed, leaned on Jesus. So look, it's not just stayed. Perfect peace. Perfect peace means peace, peace. means complete completeness. So we're not talking about just physical peace. We're talking about mental peace, emotional peace, Psychological peace, spiritual peace. When you let your mind on God, you know I'm, 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 I'm on final course. And praise God, I just finished my next to my last week. Next week we're off. Next week we're off for Thanksgiving. Then the following week, one more week, and I'll be graduated. Praise God. Can't wait. But the last one is on pastoral counseling. And it's all about bringing the Word, incorporating the Word in all of your counseling. And of course, I wrote down there, I never do counseling without His Word. Because every time I find somebody, it's like to include my own going to all the pieces. The only thing, the only thing, the only thing that can bring me peace. And the only thing that can give me strength is to hold on to something solid. And the only thing solid I know is God's Word. Perfect peace. Perfect peace. This is such an awesome peace. Because it's the greatest peace inward, outward, at all times, and in any circumstance. DC, Jeff, y'all guys come on up here. so I can see it. Y'all say this with me. If you can't run, fly. Y'all say it. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. Whatever you have to do, keep, whatever you have to do, I can't even say it, to keep moving forward. One more time. If you can't fly, then run. Look at somebody telling that. If you can't fly, then run. 
If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. Whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Wow. Keep moving forward. Amen. Everybody stand up. We got one more, one more installment. Just remember, so far, we've had the direction. Only facing one. We've had the decision. We're not going back. I say God's got this. God is. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here today, the very first thing, you're here today. I'm going to embarrass you now. You're here today and you say, Pastor, I just don't know Jesus, period. No, I don't know him. How can I know his peace if I don't know him? How can I stand on his word when I don't even know what his word says? I need a relationship with God. Nobody looking around, every eye closed. Bless the Lord. 
bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Maybe you're here today. And your problem at this moment is, and be honest with yourself, you're having a problem staying up on that cross. You keep wanting to climb down. That's bringing pain. That's bringing injury. But today you decided, I'm not blaming anybody else. It's me. I'm climbing off that cross. I'm the one that's stepping down. I need you, God, to help me. And nobody looking around, every eye closed. We just put that hand and say, yes, 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 I'm guilty. Bless the Lord. I'm guilty. I need you today. Now let's all pray together. All of us. Y'all pray out loud with me. Father, I know it's not easy putting my hand to the plow and looking ahead. I know it's not easy staying up on that cross when there's so many things around me. But with your help, I can do this. I refuse to blame anybody else. I take full responsibility for my actions. And now, Lord, help me. Renew me. Breathe new life in me. Raise up these dry bones. Help me to get back on the cross. Help me to put my hand back to the plow. And help me be all I can be for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Give the Lord a hand to have a praise. Yeah. Now, if anybody needs prayer, special prayer, needs anything, now you can come on up. It's not a problem. Come on up now. It'll be fine. no service this Tuesday night because of Thanksgiving, but y'all remember, I will be going to Greensburg, but for Thanksgiving, my daddy wanted the chicken, a turkey leg, but instead he's getting a new hip. <laughs> so y'all y'all remember him, and I threw this hip, but then I reckon within a month they're going to do another hip, but he's getting his new hip, and so I'll be going up there and spend some time with dad. So, uh, this Tuesday night, there is not a service because of Thanksgiving, but the following week, and things are going to be a little different because Christmas is coming up, but none of this, that we're just about through, I could go on, I could do the whole year on mindfulness, but I'm not, I don't want the, I don't want the blessing to become a burden, so, so another week or two and we're through with that, we'll be going to something else, but I want you to know something, those who have been coming up to us tonight, even before the mindfulness or live now that's trauma. We've been going over things like how to detect depression, how to help people out of depression. I mean, you've been actually getting counseling classes and 
and, and how to detect suicide, how to talk, how to talk to people when they're in a suicidal mode, how to, and all this stuff we've been doing. It. The reason that you're getting all this stuff is because we don't want church to stay inside these walls. And when you go outside, I want you to be able to put some feet on your prayers. When you go out and start talking to people, when you start recognizing things, then you can get the right people involved. You can call me or call whoever, do whatever needs to be done. But, but if you can only realize how much is being invested in you to go out and make a difference in people's lives, a positive, strong, working difference. So, so all that we want, Think about it for New Year coming up. Tuesday nights, I like what I like what's going on uh, Eddie calls the School of Ministry. Uh, Tuesday night, Elvis Scott School of Ministry is to uh, come on, get built up, you get handouts, you get training, take it and go out and help people. It's important. People are hurting everywhere I go. It's like you can't go anywhere without people. You think if people, people got all together? I, Discovered that nobody's got it together. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I've also discovered that every family is dysfunctional. That's right. My family put the funk in dysfunctional. Wait a second. It's important <coughs> that we learn this stuff. And it's all biblical. This is not some off the wall mess. All biblical. And it's there. So we can go out and be a powerful force. And you want to see the church grow? You gotta start using the stuff you're learning. And go out and start making a difference in people's lives. And watch how the church will grow and grow and grow and grow. Because people will say, you know what? There was a difference made in my life. And I and, and, and I need to get in there and find out more so I can make a difference in somebody else's life. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. Good. Amen. All the time. That's right. That's right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. We ask your blessings be upon this congregation and everyone else that's not here and that is sick. We ask your blessings upon them in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.